um, thank you, Dr. Funk and Dr. Majid, for this invitation to talk about bariatric surgery and the cancer patient. I have nothing to disclose. So uh, the way I want to outline this talk is basically to talk about obesity and the risks of cancer, uh, obesity and cancer screening, the effect of bariatric surgery on hormonally sensitive cancers, and whether or not we can actually use bariatric surgery as a bridge to cancer care. Um, we all know that there is an association between obesity and cancer. There's more than 13 different types of cancers that are now associated with it. We really don't know the mechanism. We know that there's some sort of inflammatory process that goes on that releases all these mediators that leads to a lot of cancers in, um, in the GI tract, in the female and male reproductive system, as well as other cancers. Uh, this study, though, was done um, uh, by using a UK clinical practice research data link which is a database that the primary care physicians there use, looking at the BMI, increase in BMI and risk of specific cancers. And what they found was that as BMI increased, uh, there was a positive association with the risk of colon cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, and ovarian cancer. But interestingly, um, with every five-point increase in BMI, there was actually a linear association uh, with, uh, 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 for cancers of the gallbladder, cervix, uterus, thyroid, kidney, and leukemia. So this suggested that BMI is associated uh, with a cancer risk. Um, it's, this is a population level effect. And uh, because of the differences in the way that they react, there is obviously different mechanisms for different cancers. What's more alarming, though, is that there's emerging trends um, or cancer trends among younger adults. Um, the incidence is significantly increased for six of 12 obesity-related cancers that are normally seen in the older adult population, um, which includes the colon, rectum, uterus, gallbladder, biliary, kidney, um, pancreatic cancer, and multiple myeloma. Additionally, if you look at these curves, um, there's steeper rises in successively younger generations. And what that means is that basically the risk of developing an obesity-related cancer is actually increasing in a stepwise manner in successively younger birth cohorts in the United States. And so, I mean, obviously this needs to be studied more, but this is this, this, is this trend. And finally, on a global level, um, this was an, um, a study done by Arnold and his group, which estimated the global burden of cancer in 2012 due to high BMI. What they found was that worldwide, there was 481,000 new cases of cancer in 2012 that were attributable to an excess BMI, taking data from 1982 to 2000, taking the weight change from 1982 to 2002. And they found that if the BMI had actually remained at 1982 levels, 25% of the BC-related cancers in 2012 could have been avoided. Most of these cancers were in North America, and 60% uh, were colon, uh, uterine, and postmenopausal breast. So, you know, I would love to say that I, I, I have this data. I found this literature that shows that, you know, when we do bariatric surgery, we can actually reduce the risk or the incidence of cancer in a very immediate way, but there's nothing out there right now. What we can do, though, is screen our patients. But there's alarming trends with respect to screening, certainly. Um, this group actually looked at body mass index and colon cancer screening um, in um, a group of obese po an obese population. And um, what they found, though, that was that while there was no, um, while there was no actual uh, difference with respect to the rate of screening for colon cancer and increase in BMI, when they actually stratified by gender and by race, they found that uh, white women had a statistically significant decreased rate of colon cancer screening the higher their BMI was. So that by the time you got to a BMI of 40 or above, they were 30% less likely to get screened for colon cancer. Um, when the same group looked at uh, obesity and mammography, they found that as, again, you get to class 3 obesity, which is a BMI of greater than 40, there was about a 20% less likely, um, uh, they were 20% less likely to be screened for breast cancer within two years. Now, all of this is self-reported data, but still, this is the data that's out there. And when they stratified based on race, they actually found that it was uh, uh, Caucasian women in class two and class three that were statistically less likely to screen themselves for breast cancer. And then finally, with um, cervical cancer screening across all BMI um, cohorts, they found that there was a statistical difference in uh, cancer screening, such that by the time you got to class three obesity, um, they were 40% less likely to be screened. And this is a little bit disconcerting, given that these are all these obesity-related cancers. Um, and really, the question is, why are, there, why are there these delays in screening? And there's been a lot of stuff in the literature that basically relates to both patient and physician factors. 
patient's perspective is that obviously for any patient, screening is painful. Um, but there's a lot of literature to say that patients are very embarrassed about their weight. There's a, there's a feeling of disrespect from the healthcare provider, as well as wanting to avoid unwanted weight loss advice from providers. From a, from a, a physician perspective, um, there's inadequate qu equipment, certainly tables and instruments. Um, there are technical difficulties in performing tests due to body habitus that can actually decrease the sensitivity and, ses and specificity of tests. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of obesity bias, which makes them less, uh, which makes physicians less likely to recommend routine screening. And I know that this concept of bias seems very esoteric, but there's a lot of research that's been done, especially out of the Rudd Center with Rebecca Puell, that basically says, unfortunately, healthcare providers are second only to a family as a source of obesity bias. And because of that, the health of patients suffer because they do not come to see us. So this is something that we really have to keep in mind. Um, so what is the effect of bariatric surgery? So this study looked at the cancer risk following bariatric surgery on national population-based cohort studies. And what they found that there was, was that there was a significant reduction in overall cancer incidence compared to control patients with obesity, a significant reduction in the incidence of obesity-related cancers, a significant reduction in the incidence of breast cancer compared to controls with obesity, but no effect on the incidence of esophageal cancer, colorectal, endometrial, or prostate cancer. So overall, it seems that it appears to be a, uh, bariatric surgery appears to be associated with a reduced incidence of cancer at a population level. On a more granular level, this study done by Daniel Schauer show, uh, looked at the association between weight loss at one year and the risk of cancer during the subsequent 10 years of follow-up. Um, so what you see there are just Kaplan-Meier survival curves, but basically what they're showing you, uh, how, how they've stratified the patients as the, all patients who underwent bariatric surgery, stratified by the amount of weight that they lost in their first year after surgery. So when they compared patients who lost greater than 30% within the first year after surgery to patients that lost 20 to 30% to patients that lost less than 20% again within the first year, more weight loss was, uh, the more weight you lost, the less incidence of cancer. And when they did their calculations, essentially it was that they found that patients having bariatric surgery who lost, uh, for each 10% of weight that they lost within their first year, there was a 14% reduction in cancer risk. So obviously, substantial weight loss may reduce cancer risk. And um, when they did a, a multivariate analysis, it was actually the weight loss related to surgery, not the surgery itself, that um, um, created these responses. So what about bariatric surgery as a bridge to cancer care? We know, I've shown that obviously it's linked to many cancers. Weight loss reduces the incidence of the cancers. But can we use weight loss as a means to enhance cancer care or improve outcomes in sort of an immediate period? So to try to answer this, because there's not a lot out there, I found this review, um, the systematic review on laparoscopic colorectal cancer resections. And what this group found was that while there was no difference in the five-year um, uh, disease-free survival rate or the overall survival rate, what they did find was that when you compared obese to non-obese, there was a statistically higher conversion rate to open and statistically higher overall morbidity, including wound infections and anastomotic leaks. So this is a possible, I mean, this is where, you know, weight loss obviously could play a role in these immediate perioperative outcomes. So again, to, to, you know, could, can we use bariatric surgery as a means to enhance cancer care? Um, unfortunately, there's nothing out there, nothing in the literature, except for one case study that demonstrated the use of sleeve gastrectomy as a bridge to robotic-assisted hysterectomy um, for a uh, low-grade endometrial tumor. Um, and the only reason I know that this exists is because this is my little case study I did with my, uh, with my gynecologist. This was a patient that um, uh, came in with a BMI of 85, and um, she was, it, her weight was prohibitive for surgery. They, she did not want bariatric surgery. They started her on progestin, but she would not respond to progestin. And so after a lot of convincing by the, her gynecologist, she uh, came to talk to me. We ultimately did a sleeve gastrectomy. She lost the weight, and eight months later, she went to surgery, and she's doing great. So there are these case studies, but there's nothing, there's no real evidence in the literature for anything. So what do you do for these patients? Um, unfortunately, it is a case-by-case -case basis at 
this point. Um, you have to consider the type and the stage of the malignancy, the life expectancy of the patient, the risk for recurrence, and the risk factors for recurrence. So, you know, if it's breast cancer and they're and they are they're a breast cancer patient, maybe they need to lose weight after therapy in order to prevent recurrence. Um, also, surveillance and screening for these patients. Again, body habitus, as I mentioned, can make screening tools less sensitive or specific. And then finally, you have to consider adjuvant therapy that they may need to be involved, that they may need to use, including medication absorption, just as we talked about with the transplant group, um, you know, radiation exposure in terms of how wide a field they would need, chemotherapy and the associated nausea and vomiting and dehydration that may be, um, that may accompany that. Um, currently, there's nothing, there's no guidelines. The only thing is really that we're insurance driven with respect to how long we're supposed to wait after, after a cancer di diagnosis. At this point, um, patients are supposed to be five year cancer free before you entertain surgery. But this is currently under review at the ASMBS. The guidelines are being written for this to help guide us. So in summary, obesity increases the risk of specific cancers, which is now being seen in a younger patient cohort. Patients with obesity are less likely to be screened for breast, cervical, and uterine cancers, even though they're at a higher risk. It increases the perioperative complications related to oncologic resection. But weight loss is associated with bariatric, the weight loss associated with bariatric surgery decreases the incidence of certain cancers. But unfortunately, there is no evidence to say that bariatric surgery improves disease-free and overall survival in patients with cancer compared to non-obese cohorts. So while I wish I could give you something to chew on here, the only take-home message I've got for you is the only thing we really can do um, as bariatric surgeons is don't assume that everybody that comes to your clinic has been screened, or even if you're not a bariatric surgeon, if you're an uh, orthopedic surgeon, don't assume a patient with obesity has been screened. Use that opportunity to um, ensure that they are adequately screened because they very rarely do come to healthcare providers, and when they do, um, you should capture them then. Thank you. <laughs>